let's move on now to um, apply the, con the concepts that I've been telling you about um, to the study of liquid crystals. All right, so I want to begin with uh, the ideas about order and symmetry um, by analogy with what we've spoken about in the other examples, in the Ising magnet and in the study of liquids and crystals. Okay. So um, let's go back to our table about um, order in liquids and crystals. Okay. So if we have this table, uh, liquids compared with crystals. So one distinction that we talked about is that in a, a crystal, there are certain special positions right, where you are more likely to find an atom than in other positions. And these, uh, because there are special positions, we could say that the crystal has a positional order. And likewise, the crystal has special directions. That is um, the directions along the crystalline axes uh, where you're likely to find uh, a row or column of atoms. Right? And so uh, associated with these special directions, we could say that the crystal has um, orientational order. And by comparison, in the liquid, um, all positions are equivalent to each other. That is, there are no special positions. At any particular instant in time, the atoms are at certain positions. But if you do a statistical average over time, then you find that uh, all positions are equally likely. So in that sense, we would say that the liquid has um, no positional order and um, no orientational order. So um, in this table, we can see uh, two ways that the liquid is different from a crystal phase, right? One in terms of positional order or lack thereof, and the other in, with orientational order or lack thereof. Okay. And so you might ask, um, do these two kinds of order need to go together? Right? That is, if you have uh, one, do you need to have the other? Right. And um, the answer is no. Right? Rather, there are certain phases, certain states of matter that have orientational order, but do not have positional order. Okay. And um, so these are liquid crystal phases. And the most common is the um, pneumatic liquid crystal, which is what I'll concentrate on here. So we have a phase, a state of matter, right, as opposed to a particular type of material. And in the nomadic liquid crystal phase, we would say there is um, no positional order. So in that respect, it's like a liquid, um, but there is orientational order. So uh, in that way, it's like a crystal. Okay. So this is uh, an intermediate phase that has one type of order, but not the other one. Um, you might also be wondering, you know, could it go the other way, right? Could there be yet a different kind of phase that has uh, positional order, but not orientational order? Um, the answer to that is mostly no, 
Uh, that is, if you have special crystal positions, then there are necessarily orientations that are a row or a column of such positions. Um, but there might be situations where um, you, know, you have uh, a certain amount of orientational order, but there could be phase transitions to having more orientational order. Um, and so that occurs in, in classes of crystals called plastic crystals. Um, so um, that, that can be a, a possibility to change the degree of orientational order with fixed positional order. Um, but I'm not going to concentrate on that. Right? I'm going to concentrate on this possibility, um, the uh, pneumatic liquid crystal phase um, with uh, no positional order, but yes, orientational order. And um, just to say a couple other uh, words that we could use to describe this sort of thing, right? So uh, a material that has uh, no positional order, we could say that it has a translational symmetry. Remember that symmetry and order are opposites of each other um, it, when it comes to the, the, the physics understanding. Right? And so uh, having symmetry under translations is the same thing as not having positional order. Right? Likewise, uh, in terms of orientations for the pneumatic, we would say it has um, broken rotational symmetry. That is, in a liquid phase, there's perfect rotational symmetry, right? You can take a liquid and rotate it by any amount, right? By 17.3 degrees or whatever angle you want, right? And it comes out just the same, right? In um, a crystal, that symmetry is broken. In a pneumatic liquid crystal, that symmetry is broken. Right? You cannot take a pneumatic uh, and rotate it by any angle and get back to the same thing. Right? If you rotate it, you'll have something different from what you started with. Um, Okay, and other words to describe this uh, distinction, um, we could say that the um, pneumatic liquid crystal is uh, uniform. That's another word to mean that all the positions are equivalent to each other, but it is not isotropic. It is anisotropic meaning that the directions are different from each other. Okay, uh, Ibrahim. Yeah, so from uh, thermodynamic point of view, which is which one is favored, a positional order or a orientational order? Well, um, both of them are, are favored at low temperature. All right, so if we were to reduce the temperature to close to zero Kelvin so that um, um, entropy is not important right, and the system just goes to its lowest energy state, then it would have both orientational order and positional order. However, what if we're not close to zero Kelvin? Right? What if we're at some intermediate temperature? Well, in that case, um, entropy is important, right? Entropy will try to get rid of order. And so um, depending on the material, right? Entropy might be able to get rid of one kind of order and not the other one, right? So it depends on how strong is the energetic preference that needs for order which needs to be overcome by entropy. Um, 
And so uh, there is a class of materials that has um, a really strong energetic preference for orientational order, but not such a strong energetic preference for positional order. Right? And so at some intermediate range of temperatures, you get one and not the other. Right? But it's always a question of, of temperature, right? that you have a temperature axis going this way, All right? And so at, at uh, zero Kelvin down there, you will normally have a, a crystal, right? And then there could be some um, intermediate range of temperature where you get the pneumatic crystal phase. And then at even higher temperature, you get an isotropic liquid, right? That is entropy defeats uh, orientational order also. So um, they're always, well, I don't know about always, they're normally will be a perfect order down at very low temperature. There normally will be total disorder at high temperature. And then the question is, what happens in between, right? And so um, will you go directly from perfect order to perfect disorder or will there be different steps in between? Right? And that depends on the material, right? It depends on the molecular structure. And, um, but for a certain class of materials, there will be this uh, step in between, which is at least one liquid crystal phase and possibly more liquid crystal phases. Um, and so, um, you know, that's why we're here in LCI, right, is to study this, this range of possibilities. Okay, great, Thank you. great point. Uh -huh. um, okay, so this, this leads then to the question of, you know, how is it possible? Right, so, um, you know, how, how to form a um, pneumatic liquid crystal phase. Right? So what sorts of um, molecules do we need? Well, um, typically, what happens is uh, we, we need a, um, a, a long, uh, narrow kind of molecular structure, okay? And so um, we, we you know, a typical liquid crystal molecule uh, looks like this, okay? So I'm gonna draw the structure of uh, five CB, five cyanobiphenyl. Um, which is a familiar thing that people work with in the lab, right? So it has uh, a couple of benzene rings, this, and it has a uh, cyano uh, group at one end, and then it has a hydrocarbon chain at the other one, two, three, four, five. Uh, okay, so, so I am um, surely the only person in LCI who needs to look at notes in order to draw this molecular structure. Uh, um, everyone else can um, do this, uh, you know, as easily as, as you know, breathing in and out. Um, so, uh, but so be it, okay. So, so this is a, a typical molecular structure. Right? And the point of view that you know, I'm going to advocate for you is a more uh, coarse grained perspective. That is, we want to abstract from this and just represent this object by an arrow. So an arrow, say, along the 
long axis of the molecule and pointing from one end to the other. And then the way that you can form uh, an, an orientationally ordered phase has to do with the arrangement of these arrows. Right? You can have different possible ways to organize the molecules Oops. in terms of their uh, positions and orientations. What did I do? Okay. So um, one possibility would be uh, an isotropic liquid. So in the isotropic liquid, um, these molecules have random positions in random directions. And I'm drawing these things, of course, in the 2D plane, but in real life, it's three-dimensional, right? that the arrows have random positions and random orientations in all three dimensions. So this would be um, an isotropic liquid of 5CB molecules. By comparison, you could make a crystal of 5CB molecules right, by having them in a regular lattice pointing the same way. So this would be uh, a crystal which forms at very low temperature. Now, to form a liquid crystal phase, what we want to do is to um, mess up the regular positions, but keep the regular orientations of the molecules to keep at least partial order of the orientations. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be some statistical order. Now, what you might guess for that, I'm gonna tell you a guess which is wrong. Okay, but here's, here's, here's a wrong guess, okay? What you would guess would be that these arrows will be pointing mostly in the same direction, but there's going to be a, a randomness of position. Okay. So here I have melted the regular positional order of the crystal, right? Here there's the regular positions, here not, okay? But there is still some statistical order of the orientations. This is a good guess, um, but in fact, it's wrong. Okay? This is not the usual pneumatic liquid crystal phase. Okay? Rather, the usual pneumatic liquid crystal phase has a different structure, which I will show here. Okay. The point is that the molecules have random positions and they tend to be oriented up and down along some axis. So you can see in this picture that I'm drawing, at least I hope you can, um, if my drawing is good enough, um, that um, there is a special axis up and down, right? That the up down direction is different from the side to side direction, right? Or the in and out direction. So um, this is a phase which has orientational order um, along a certain axis, but it's orientational order that is equally pointing up and down, right? unlike this guess, which has orientational order that is just pointing up. So the word for this guess is 
a polar face. And um, we could say that, you know, there's a whole sequence going from isotropic liquid to pneumatic to polar to crystal of going to more and more order. Okay, so um, the, the increasing order uh, looks like looks like this, right? Uh, one, two, three, four. Excuse me, a question. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the interaction between those arrows? Um, well, the, the interaction between the arrows is, um, you know, it's an interaction between molecules like like this one, right? Um, it's it's complicated, right? And so the the students here who take courses on liquid crystal chemistry um, learn about that sort of thing, right? In much more detail than I can speak about it. Right? Um, in general. Um, the, an important part of the interaction uh, is a, a van der Waals interaction, right? That is, um, there are uh, fluctuations in the dipole moment of one molecule, which tend to induce fluctuations in the dipole moment of another molecule. Okay, so if I draw, um, if I draw two arrows here, oh, I'm making them red. If I draw two arrows there, yeah. okay. um, you could say, suppose there's a fluctuation of uh, electrons moving up and down inside the molecule. Uh, so at some moment, there will be a positive charge at one end and a negative charge at the other end. Okay that will tend to uh, induce uh, a fluctuation over here. So um, then the dipole moments will interact. Uh, I guess I drew this backwards, didn't I? I drew that backwards. It should be, it will tend to induce a minus plus like that, okay? And then the dipole moments will interact. This um, mechanism works equally well if you have uh, arrows pointing parallel or arrows pointing anti-parallel. It does not work so well if the arrows are perpendicular to each other, because in this situation, if there's a fluctuation in the dipole moment in one molecule, it can induce a little bit of a fluctuation there, but it can't induce very much of a fluctuation there because the electrons don't have so much room to move around in that direction. So um, that means that um, th these, uh, these arrangements, parallel or anti-parallel, will be highly favored, right? But the perpendicular, not so favored. So um, that is a mechanism which tends to give order along a certain axis. And that particular mechanism doesn't care whether it's order that is parallel or anti-parallel. Okay. However, that's an oversimplification, right? That chemistry is complicated and there are all kinds of possible interactions as well on top of that, right? And um, those interactions uh, probably break the symmetry between this and this structure and favor either parallel or anti-parallel, right? But 
That preference can be overcome by entropy. That preference is not so strong, it can be overcome by entropy. And it usually is, okay? So that's why this sort of phase, uh, pneumatic liquid crystal, is a very common phase, which is studied all the time in LCI. This polar liquid is, uh, is possible, but it's rare. It, it doesn't happen a lot, but it is a subject of current research is to study the possibility of um, getting a, a phase with this kind of order. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Jonathan. Uh, Abhijay, please. Uh, I mean, uh, you talked about the uh, dispersive force, but uh, uh, liquid crystals uh, might have permanent dipole moment or hydrogen bonding. And uh, these uh, uh, parallel and anti parallel structures, maybe because of uh, hydrogen bond, sorry, maybe because of uh, these permanent dipoles uh, rather than. Uh, uh, these uh, uh, dispersive forces interaction. Well, that's absolutely right. And so um, there, there sh surely are permanent dipoles on the structure like this one that I drew. And so there is going to be uh, some um, dipole-dipole interaction, which will um, um, not be equivalent, right? For, for parallel or anti-parallel alignment. Um, uh, yes, yes, absolutely. And then hydrogen bonding is very specific to just what sort of compound we have. And it's not yes. a universal thing from one material to another. So yes, this subject of liquid crystal chemistry uh, is a big subject, right? And there are, um, you know, I have colleagues in the in LCI who who spend their lives working on that sort of thing, and um, I'm glad they do it so I don't have to. <laughs> um, um, so uh, yes, it's it's uh, it's it's a big subject indeed, um, and uh, so so what was I saying? Right, but so based on those, right, there is a possibility of having a polar phase. But it doesn't happen very often, right? And the thing that usually happens is not this, but this. Okay, so this is the pneumatic liquid crystal. So this is the main thing that people in the field of liquid crystal study, and that's the main thing I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the semester. We could say that, um, that there is increasing order as you go from isotropic liquid to pneumatic to polar to crystal. Right? Um, you could also say that there is um, breaking of symmetry, right? Going from isotropic liquid to pneumatic liquid crystal, we are breaking the rotational symmetry, right? And so in the isotropic liquid, all directions are equivalent to each other. In the pneumatic liquid crystal, by comparison, there is a special axis up and down in this picture. When we go, I mean, when, if we go from a pneumatic liquid crystal to a polar phase, we are further breaking a symmetry, right? We're breaking the symmetry between up versus down, right? In the pneumatic liquid crystal phase, up and down are equivalent to each other. In the polar phase, they are no longer equivalent to each other. And the arrows are mostly pointing either up or down. And then, going from polar to crystal, we're further breaking translational symmetry. So these different types of symmetry breaking 
depending on the material, they might happen all at once or they might happen in stages, right? So in, um, in 5CB, you could go from isotropic liquid to pneumatic and then pneumatic to crystal, okay? There's no polar phase. In material like water, you would go directly from isotropic liquid to crystal, right? There's no liquid crystal phase of water, right? And so, you know, in typical generic materials, you go directly from isotropic liquid to crystal. In many liquid crystal compounds, you go uh, this way and then this way. It's only in a few weird, unusual examples studied in current research that you would go like that, you know, through the polar phase before you get to the crystal. But this is the normal thing to work on. This is not the normal thing to study. Uh, okay, so the reason why I'm talking about this polar phase is mainly just for conceptual purposes, just to say, you know, here's a kind of order that doesn't usually happen. And pneumatic is the kind of order that does usually happen. So, as you know, we, we like to speak about order parameters that characterize what kind of order is present. So, um, let's try to think now uh, about what would be a good um, order parameter uh, to describe uh, orientation order. Remember, we want an order parameter to describe both the magnitude and the direction of orientational order. Okay. So in this, um, in, in, if we want to say, you know, how is the pneumatic different from isotropic? Whoops. How, how is pneumatic different from isotropic, right? Um, what could we do to characterize that, right? Well, we want the statistical average of something, but what sort of thing should we take the average of, right? Well, um, when we were dealing with the crystal, we had this story about um, looking at the Fourier coefficients of the density as a function of position. But that had to do with the positions of the molecules, not with the orientations. Okay. So we need to look at something different associated with the orientations of the molecules. All right, so we have some ensemble of molecules like this. Each of these is characterized pretty well by some unit vector that says which direction it's pointing. Okay. So let's say there's a unit vector for each molecule. Okay. Um, I will uh, write that unit vector as L for molecule I. You yeah, make it a superscript like that in parentheses. L for molecule I. So uh, I here equals the mole molecular number, uh, the, 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 the molecule number. Which molecule? I equals which molecule? Okay, uh, and so we could say this is from one to 10 to the 23rd. Okay, um, all right. So we have a, a lot of these unit vectors. Okay. 
and the distribution of these unit vectors should be able to characterize which phase we're in, right? Whether it is um, isotropic or pneumatic or polar, right? So what can we do with these unit vectors? Okay. So the first thing you might think of doing is to average them. So we'll average the unit vectors. So we could define an order parameter, which is the average of the L vectors. So this order parameter would be a vector, right? It would be, what do you get if you add up all of those for the N molecules, L for the N molecules and divide by the number of molecules. So this is uh, N equals the 10 to the 23rd molecules. Um, okay, so uh, what would we get if we try to calculate this vector order parameter? Um, well, uh, let's think about that in each of these phases, okay? If we want to calculate the vector order parameter in the isotropic liquid, well, we would say in the statistical ensemble, the vectors are equally likely to be pointing in any direction. Okay, so um, it you know the average of the x component will be zero. The average of the y component will be zero. The average of the z component will be zero. Okay, so uh, that means that. Um, M equals zero in the isotropic phase. Okay, what about in the pneumatic phase? Well, hmm. in the pneumatic phase, the vectors are equally likely to be pointing either, you know, left or right in X. So that X component will average to zero they're equally likely to be pointing it's left or right in Z also, right? Because this Z axis is equivalent to going down, right? So the Z component will also average to zero and the Y component in or out of the plane of the screen will also average to zero. Oh, so this is a problem, right? Because we now also have m equals zero in the pneumatic phase. This is bad news, right? Because it means that this order parameter cannot tell the difference between pneumatic and isotropic. By comparison, we could look at the same order parameter in the polar phase, okay? In the polar phase, if we you know, look in the uh, x direction, uh, the, the, the x component here will average to zero, but the z component up or down will not average to zero, right? There's a difference between um, the direction going up and the direction going down. So this order parameter will be um, non-zero in the polar phase. So if we were studying these unusual polar phases, then M would be a great order parameter to use, right? And so we could say, um, 
m is the polar order parameter. So um, we can keep it in reserve for some time in the future when we might want to study such polar liquid crystals. Um, it is uh, very similar to the ferromagnetic order parameter that we talked about in the uh, case of the Ising model. Uh, it's not exactly the same because for the Ising model, there were only two possibilities, right? Up or down. But for the, um, for the uh, polar phase, M could be pointing in any direction in three dimensional space. But still, it's a similar sort of idea. Um, okay, so um, that uh, was a good try, but it didn't work. Okay, so we need something different okay, to characterize a nomadic phase. So what can we do that's different? Right? Well, we know that um, the reason why the the polar order parameter doesn't work for the pneumatic is that it is odd in these orientations, right? That is, it gives the negative thing if we have uh, arrows pointing this way versus arrows pointing that way. Right? Whereas really we want to construct an order parameter so that um, vectors that are aligned up along the axis and down along the axis will add up in the same way, okay? So we really want something that is uh, even, right? So for a, for a nomadic order parameter, we could say it must be even in all of the L vectors. So we need to combine the L vectors in a, a different way, which involves an even number of L vectors. Right? Um, so let's try something, okay? So let's try a dot product. Okay, so we could calculate the average of Li dot Li, like that. Okay. Mm, bummer, there's a problem here, which is that Li dot li is always one because these things are unit vectors. Okay, so this is the average of one. It's just one in every phase. So this order parameter is totally useless. Forget that. Okay, um, okay. let's think of something else. Okay, let's um, try the cross product. So we could calculate the average of Li cross Li. Oh man, this is even worse, right? Because Li cross Li, that's zero. So this is equal to zero in every phase. Well, that is totally useless. So I'll cross that off too. Okay. But we still need some way to combine um, uh, uh, an even number of these things. Well, how about that tensor product that I was telling you about a couple of days ago? All right. Let's try that. Um, so we want the tensor product of L i with L 
pi. And we'll average that thing. Okay. Well, this looks maybe promising. Okay, so this object is some tensor. We're going to calculate an average of tensors. Okay. So this will be a tensor order parameter. Well, it seems like it's worth a try. So let's let's explore that one. Okay, um, it's a tensor. Okay, so that means it has uh, components in every direction, x, y, and z. So the, there are tensor components for that order parameter. Okay. So first of all, if we look at uh, any particular vector L, for molecule number i, that vector has x, y, and z components. So there's an li sub x, an li sub y, an li sub z. If we want to write those things in this tensor component notation that I've been presenting to you, we would write the components as L I sub alpha, where alpha equals X, Y, or Z. So this is for molecule I, three directions in space. Now, if we take a tensor product, L I, tensor product with L I, um, this is a uh, tensor um, and this tensor has two components, right? And so if uh, it has components, I mean, it's a rank two tensor. So it has components, which are L I alpha and L I beta where alpha equals x, y, and z, and beta equals x, y, or z. Right. So in total, this thing has nine components. Now we want to average them over all of the molecules. So we have an average tensor L I alpha L I beta. So that means we're adding up over all the molecules L I alpha L I beta like that. Okay, and dividing by the number of molecules. And this makes an averaged tensor. Let's call that T, tensor T sub alpha beta. So this is a tensor with components alpha equals x, y, z, and beta equals x, y, C. So we want to work out what is T alpha beta in 
the isotropic phase and in the pneumatic phase. And then to see if they are different. Okay. And um, the spoiler is yes, they are different. And so that's, um, that's going to be useful for us. Um, I'm, I'm getting low on time. I'm going to have to um, do this calculation in the next class. Okay. But are there questions about the, the concept here? Anybody? <laughs> 